So three academics, we have Mary Andelich Madrumner from Baylor Medical College, Robert Cook Deegan, Bob Cook Deegan from Duke, so with lots and lots of good Stanford connections. And the only law professor, as any of our speakers today, in a program at Stanford Law School, Jake Shurko, who's a law professor at New York School of Law, New York Law School, uh, and four months ago was a fellow at the Center for Law and the Biosciences. So Mary, you're going first? Yeah. The floor is yours. Hi, welcome. Um, and I think there is some logic to this change. Um, when I arrived here this morning, I told Hank that I was here as a sponge um, because I was hoping to soak up lots of information that would be useful to my colleagues and I in our academic work as we try to inform um, the work of policymakers and other stakeholders to make their lives easier. But he said, no, I was supposed to be a spark. Um, so I was supposed to um, sort of ignite in the audience um, some interesting questions. Um, but I've decided the real metaphor is I'm kindling. Um, I am going to be the material that sets up um, the speakers that follow me, in particular Bob Cook Deegan, um, to give him some material to work with. And then he's going to throw some flames um, into the audience. So let me see if I can find my slides. <laughs> That's true. Okay, forget that. Um, how do I find? Close this out. Okay, and I am going to focus on next generation sequencing because that's the nature of our work, although the themes um, may relate to other kinds of genetic testing. And you've already seen um, this article, but again, just putting it up here to highlight the importance seen from on high in resolving the policy issues surrounding this technology in order for it to move forward. And as we thought about policy issues, again, I'm just recapping some of the discussion already, a lot of players, including um, folks that are very beyond traditional government regulation. So I think what we're seeing as, for example, payers um, becoming very important, if not in regulation, then in setting standards um, that determine which technologies move forward, and also recognizing the role of the states as well as the federal government, and we even have the professional societies in there. Um, so that what is what makes our policy work both interesting and very challenging. So the official title of the grant that is funding this work is Clinical, Clinical Integration of Next Generation Sequencing, a Policy Analysis. My colleague Amy McGuire is now the sole remaining um, PI, Dave Kaufman having left to become a public servant, um, but still being somewhat active um, in carrying this work forward. And to paraphrase Walt Whitman, I am small, but I contain multitudes. So I am speaking on behalf of many, many other people who are part of the team. And so my slides are taken directly from my colleagues, Amy McGuire and Maggie Kernute in particular. So our project has two primary components. The first is a landscape analysis, just to capture the face of the industry um, and to see how that relates to specific policy challenges. And primarily this work is based on a web-based search. Um, at the cutoff, we had 100 companies operating in the clinical space um, using NGS technology or creating it, and also some interviews with industry leaders. And hot off the presses, some of you may have gotten an email blast um, concerning a piece that just came out in Nature Biotechnology discussing some of the findings from this work. We used a broad definition of clinical. It was basically meeting one of these criteria, um, and that includes feeding into the clinical trial work. And as many others have noted, um, there is a pipeline with many steps, and that's part of what makes next generation sequencing um, a particular regulatory challenge, with a lot of the interesting action being in the post-analytic phase. 
So uh, my colleagues came up with this beautiful figure. Each um, row is a different company operating in this space. And one of the things highlighted here is how much of the activity is in interpretation and recording. So pretty low barriers to entry, um, some regulatory uncertainty, and I think even post-FDA guidance, um, some real questions about where the lines will be drawn um, in terms of what's the device, what's the service, what's the practice of medicine. Um, the other thing I'd like to highlight here in terms of the light-colored um, rows is what we refer to in the piece, or my colleagues refer to in the piece, is fragmentation, certainly segmentation in the industry with some companies operating solely doing sequencing and larger numbers only doing the alignment to data storage piece. So again, specific challenges for regulation and lots of players. Oh, and because this is California, I had to highlight that we are crowdsourcing the updating of the table that underlies that figure. So appealing to you all um, to make this an even better tool um, for informing policy. And finally, I just wanted to mention um, something about the interviews. Uh, we were willing to get people to say in, in a more private forum, um, sort of a pox on the FDA, right? Some people willing to say, I think that regulation necessarily stifles innovation or pointing to a particular problem with the speed of innovation and the challenges that that presents to regulators. And then um, a position that I think we've heard articulated here several times, I have real concerns about some of the players. I think the clinical validity issues are important, but I'm not sure FDA um, is the right place for whatever regulation or oversight needs to occur. And then finally, some people who were willing to give the FDA some love. So um, not to leave that out. Um, pleasantly surprised, very flexible, recognizing the realities and um, expressing a notion, which I think the last panel really supported that industry um, and all the other stakeholders really should seek more collaborative relationships. So going on to the second major component, um, there are so many policy issues that I gather one of the real goals of our grant is to try to prioritize the issues. Um, so we select what we will tackle. And we are in the very early stages of that. And so again, um, that's in my sponge role, trying to collect your opinions about um, what needs to be addressed first. What we've already done in this area is um, commission uh, content experts to provide legal analysis of some of the areas that we are most interested in. Um, and then we are beginning a modified Delphi process. So um, first on the legal analysis, again, hot off the presses. This is actually open access, um, a special supplement to the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics covering a number of domains. And if you can actually read the type, um, you may be thinking at this point, well, you're up here talking about this project, but uh, you don't appear to have done any of the work. And yes, it is a very sweet deal that I get to come to California and talk about this. Um, I think there's kind of a theme of being new to the job, and I joined this project at the end of July. So uh, I'm, I'm finding it fascinating, and that applies to this meeting as well. So, uh, But we started out looking at regulation, reimbursement, subsuming coverage there as well, and intellectual property issues, but we are also um, seeking to broaden um, to the extent there are other important issues. So the modified Delphi. Um, so some of you are probably familiar with the Delphi process. We have a panel of experts. In our case, it's a very diverse group of stakeholders. Um, here are the self-identified folks who completed the first survey. So we got 43 of 47, which I think is pretty good. Um, and we sort of are tapping their expertise to have us identify the issues. And then by the fourth survey, we're hoping to field possible policy options for the top three priority challenges. Um, so that's the framework. And I'm just going to share a little of the data from the first survey. Um, so we created 19 policy challenges distributed across these three areas, conventional regulation, coverage reimbursement, and IP. And one piece of the survey was to rank 
each challenge for importance individually. And the number one challenge was proprietary databases. Um, so it's an IP challenge. All of the others that rose above are somewhat arbitrary. Cutoff um, of a 60 score uh, had to do with payment and particularly issues surrounding clinical utility. So um, I imagine that's where we're going to be spending at least some of our time in the future. And this is where I'm kindling. So we also had uh, panelists rank things, these challenges for political feasibility and some other factors and look at number 17. So that was proprietary databases. It's absolutely the lowest in terms of political feasibility. And here's where I'm kindling um, because I think Bob is going to address this. Uh, the final thing is you may have noticed with the individual challenges, um, none of the FDA related challenges rose to the top. And I think that probably says something about uh, how academics lag behind regulatory innovation because while this survey was out, the FDA released its guidance. So we think that may have had something to do with the fact that the challenges as we framed them were already old news. Um, and so we are working in our second survey and beyond to try to do a better job of capturing what's really important about FDA regulation. And that is my conclusion. So am I under my 10 minutes? Yes. Thank you. Where do we have all these things? Who's our tech person here? I do not do Windows. I'm a Mac person. Somebody want to come up? Mary, do you know how? Where I'm providing technical assistance, you can tell things are really bad. Um, okay, here we go. Here we go. I'm, I apologize. Um, first of all, I wanted to open with a little bit of a somber note. I realized that five years ago, coming out here to Stanford, about five years ago, one of the cases, the, the, the Myriad case had started. The lawsuit had been filed in, in, um, in May of 2009, and I was actually calling out to Stanford to find out uh, what John Barton was up to, um, because he and I had been talking for years about possibly doing an amicus brief in some case, if it ever came up, that there would be a diagnostic case that would happen. And here was the one that we were talking about. And I found out that he had died in a, in, as the result of a bike accident. So for those of you who were Stanford Law students or had association with him, just a moment of memoriam for him, because otherwise he would undoubtedly be here participating in this symposium today. Um, another observation is I'm an academic, and therefore we don't need a disclaimer. <laughs> I don't have any idea what it would mean to speak for Duke University, and if I did, I don't know that you would want to pay any attention to it anyway. Um, and I am going to use PowerPoint. I, apparently, there have been some questions about whether you can use the stuff that's on the PowerPoints. That's the whole point. Most of my slides, I've tried to find things that if you can use them, that's the main use, reason for displaying them, is there are some links to resources that you may be able to uh, use yourself, and that's the point of having it available, so it should be available to everybody. Um, I don't want Hank to feel about me the way he feels about PowerPoint. Um, so we know how Hank feels about PowerPoint. Um, we don't want that to spill over to the users of it. Love, love the center, hate the center. That's right. <laughs> there we go. So, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but here are the main players, and I am going to start with patents, and I'm going to move to a single central message. And the central message is that the, the, the ball to keep your eye on in this game is not going to be so much intellectual property per se as a form of intellectual property that is information flow and how information flows to allow us to interpret the data that we're going to be creating value out of over the next 20 years. And it's that information flow. It's the dams and eddy currents that screw that up that we really need to be paying attention to. The BRCA story is a beautiful example of all sorts of policy surprises that have emerged from having a set of incentives in place for how do you make money out of the system that misaligns the incentives with where we want to go. So 
I'm going to be using it as an illustration of many of the issues that come up. The story is a science story with the discovery by Mark Skolnick and the group at Utah and Myriad of BRCA1, but it really started with Mary Claire King, who's on the central part of this slide, who was counseling a woman, the very kind of woman that we want to be able to take advantage of these technologies, Joanna Rednick, who is herself a BRCA carrier of a mutation. She actually developed cancer after having some kids. Um, and she is the head of the Free the Data mo movement that um, Bob Nussbaum and others in this room are participating in. Um, and in the bottom right corner is Mike Stratton, who probably discovered the BRCA2 gene that's disputed. Um, he does not have the intellectual property rights for the BRCA2 gene, um, or at least he doesn't in the United States. His patent lapsed here. He got one in the UK, and he never got a patent in the rest of Europe. Um, and then the woman who's really behind the story we're going to tell down here in the bottom left is Tanya Simoncelli, who was working at the American Civil Liberties Union. This slide is to illustrate just one thing. This is um, my uh, April to June of uh, 2013 slide, and it's my pigs fly slide. Pigs fly because this was the shocker that made everybody in the intellectual property business think that the system was completely discombobulated, and the Supreme Court really didn't know what it was doing, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. But um, so that, this, most of these photographs were taken on the front steps of the Supreme Court on tax day of April um, of 2013. So April 15th, oral arguments. May 14th, Angelina Jolie does her op-ed in the New York Times and doubles the rate of people calling up to get BRCA testing in the US and Canada. Uh, huge celebrity effect, bringing attention to it. And then June the 13th, the Supreme Court comes down. Now the reason I've got this slide here is not to go through the legal details or the events, but rather to point out this is not your typical patent case. You don't usually have demonstrations on the steps of the Supreme Court for this kind of a case, many other kinds of a case. This was a patent case that elicited a whole diverse range of constituencies that don't usually pay attention to patent law, and now they do. And I don't think that's a reversible phenomenon. Um, and incidentally, uh, in the bottom here, is this is my legion of 10 of us stood in line at 3 a.m. in the rain to get into the oral arguments. Um, so we had a really, really good time that day once we woke up. Here's the result of that, that final decision. We do have some clear indications from the Supreme Court that are overruling decisions of the next court below them, which is usually the presidential court for patent policy in the United States, that no, you cannot patent DNA molecules whose sequences would be found in nature. No, you cannot patent methods that are in the nature of, uh, that, that reach to a law of nature and then just write your claims around it so that you capture the, the uh, value from that. But yes, you can patent a DNA molecule that you have engineered. Um, now, those are kind of, I've just explained that in what sounds like coherent English. Um, the problem is, I love Justice Breyer. He's, you know, if you have baseball cards for Supreme Court justices, I'd have his, although I think I'd have Ruth Bader Ginsburg's a little bit higher. Um, but I would have his card, but I don't know what he was trying to say in the Mayo opinion. Um, and my students actually thought Justice Thomas was completely asleep during the, the oral arguments. It turns out he wasn't. He wrote the opinion. I think it's a pretty clearly written opinion. There's a beautiful sentence that explains the ruling. Um, but, and he's very clear that, yes, complementary DNA can be patented because it's been engineered. And no, sequences that would be found in nature cannot be patented. Um, but I have no idea. How that, that, how that line was drawn, or how you're going to know anything if you're a client um, trying to figure out what are you going to do about intellectual property in this space. What's patentable, what isn't? I don't think I would know. I'm really glad I'm not a patent lawyer trying to serve my clients, because I would not know what to tell them. Um, so what we have is Supreme Court has said, we know something. There's a line to be drawn between stuff that's patentable and stuff that isn't patentable, and you guys figure out where it is. And I think that's where we are. Um, the case is not over. This is just to remind you, I'm wearing my Supreme Court tie today. This is the, the tie that I bought to wear to the oral arguments uh, a year ago. Um, and I wore it again 
just last Monday, a week ago today, there was uh, an oral argument again at the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. There are now 10 cases that have been consolidated in one court in Salt Lake City, um, and that court, that case will go to trial. This is basically Myriad suing Ambry and then seven other competitors, um, and uh, one of those cases set, has settled out of court, um, but the other cases may go forward, or last Monday it was the appeals decision on an injunction. So Myriad actually asked to stop competition, to stop Myri Ambry Genetics from being able to offer its test, and the judge in Salt Lake City said no, I'm not sure enough that you guys are going to win that I'm willing to put it, put the kibosh on competition. So yes, you may get, you guys you may win or you may lose, but I'm not so sure. So we're not going to have an injunction. That decision is what was appealed to the Court of Appeals, and we'll hear from them sometime soon. And in the meantime, the Federal Court of Australia has upheld one claim that was challenged in Australia on DNA molecular claims. So this is the appeals court level in Australia. That is now being appealed to their equivalent of the Supreme Court, their high court in Australia. And where we are right now is I've, sh I've shown you the jurisprudence in the United States, which is no, you cannot patent a DNA sequence that would be found in nature. In Australia, it is quite explicitly the opposite, that yes, you can. And that's where we are. But that's not the story. I don't even think that's the most important story. The important story is blockages in the flow of information that we need to be able to interpret genetic variation and particularly to do the kind of clinical uh, and scientific inference that we need to do over the next two decades. There are lots of reasons not to share data. It is a pain in the butt. Sometimes it's difficult your, to get your data into databases where they can be used. And it is absolutely the case that most of the databases that are out, yet out there being used for clinical inference up until very recently were established for research purposes, not for clinical inference. And they have all those disclaimers on them, saying don't use us for clinical inference, even though we're the only sources of information on the planet that you can actually use for that purpose. So, and there are liability concerns, although I don't know what they are, and I haven't had those clearly explained to me. Um, but here's, I think, the main reason that data are being withheld right now. And Myriad is the most salient, but it is by no means the only player that is following this kind of uh, business model. It's really valuable. Here you have the annual revenues from BRCA1 and 2 testing at Myriad year by year. And what you'll see is in 2004, that was a really miraculous year for Myriad. They started making money, they stopped sharing their data, and they started doing a whole lot of tests. You see, that's about when they started taking off. That is when they stopped sharing their data with the Breast Cancer Information Corps at NHGRI. And what you can see there is this is a proxy. This is $2.8 billion in revenue that have flowed to Myriad uh, while they've been offering this test. And you'll see that the vast, vast majority of those tests, those million tests, have been done since the period when they stopped sharing data in 2004. What that means is in the United States, all these tests were going to one place, which means this all went into one database, which means it's the only place in the United States where these data have been stored. That means they have a proprietary database that's built on a service monopoly that was enabled by their patent status. This is not the way we think of patents usually working. Patents are supposed to be about being open and creating new information. Here is a proprietary database leveraged off of a patent-based monopoly. It's a new phenomenon. Um, one of the things that it leads to, this is a famous quote from, from uh, Peter Meldrum, the CEO of Myriad, about their um, using BRCA1. They're trying to get uh, it certified as a companion diagnostic through FDA, uh, among other things. And uh, this is what he told his stockholders about the use of BRCA in PARP inhibitor trials, which is basically we have a test nobody else can use to the same degree we can, and that's the way it is. And he's been heavily, heavily criticized for this. Partly his uh, PR people should probably train him to be not quite so blunt in public, even when he's talking to stockholders. On the other hand, what he says here is true, and people in clinical genetics would agree with it. What it is is a business responding to the incentives that that business faces. And this is the best way for Myriad to make money right now, which is to keep their data proprietary. Now, 
we've talked about this, but I only wanted to make one simple point about the FDA part, which is that almost everything we're talking about here, uh, not entirely, but most of what we're talking about here is not the accuracy of actually measuring what you say you're measuring, but rather inferring what that means clinically. It's going to be mainly in the flow of data, not from the machine into the computer, but from the computer to the patient. That part of the process is the part that we're going to have to be working on. And I think the key element there is going to be access to the underlying data and transparency of the process of doing the analysis. Um, and I'm a bit despairing, frankly, that we have the policies in place to set up the incentives the way we want them to because as far as I can tell, all of the players in this game are saying it's somebody else's problem to deal with the information flow. And I see this as a pretty big problem. I'll loop back to this, but basically as a payer, CMS could say we will only test pay, for, pay for tests that are independently verifiable. And accreditors could also say if you're a lab in this business, we're going to make sure the system creates the information that allows us to build a learning system over time. We're not going to accredit labs that don't share their data when those data are clinically absolutely necessary for clinical interpretation. So there are some policy hooks that have not been used. One comment about data. We constantly use this idea of property in the framework of data. It's a really bad idea in the context of data because if I have data and you have data, we can both use them simultaneously without subtracting value from each other. In fact, typically we are adding value incrementally at both positions. If the more we use them, the more eyes are seeing them, the more value is created. But we insist on using this word property which is an exclusive property right to block use. That's what exclusive rights do. So um, I think it's the wrong question, it's the wrong frame, and we need to come up with a different way of talking about it. I think what we need are two things, really, and I think it really is almost just as simple. People need access to the data, and we need access to data at three levels, individuals, for science, and for clinical inference, and we need the tools that are being used to interpret the data to be open and transparent. We need to be able to have reproducible scientific findings and we need to have in independently verifiable science and clinical inference. So we need the, the algorithms and the models that are being used under the surface to be available. And it's not just me saying this. The Academy has done three reports that all reach this, this very sensible conclusion and we've got they're separated by almost a decade. I think the Precision Medicine Report is a landmark. It tells us where we need to go, and it completely depends on building a learning system that is built on access to data and transparency of analysis. This slide is in here because the rules just changed a week ago today, um, and this is a new right that has been enshrined in the HIPAA uh, uh, amendments. So as of last Monday, uh, people can go to a lab, and those of you who are running labs, I don't know what this means yet, but they're going to be able to come to you and ask for the return of their results, and not just the interpreted results, but probably the underlying data. Um, and the, the uh, link there is to an article by Barbara Evans, who just published a paper last week that uh, I would urge everybody who's in this business to pay attention to because she's making the argument about what this uh, new change in the policy is. But it embodies a principle that George Church and his colleagues uh, articulated in science in January of this year. And that is, if the data are about me, I have a right to see it. And this is now enshrouded in, in, in um, US law. And here's where I'm going to loop back to what Mary said, which is, notice we had the thing that was ranked top in importance and top in being valid as a policy concern and bottom in political feasibility. Well, that's not where you want to be in a vibrant democracy. What that says is we think that the politics are so poisonous and impossible that we can't solve the most important problem facing our field. I don't buy that. Um, so here are th a few things that we can do. We can ask payers to demand independent verifiability of the results that they pay for we can ask accreditors to pay attention to the flow of information through the system so that the system works better overall. And I think we can count on consumers to pay an increasing amount of attention to getting access to their data and sending it where it needs to go. 
the uh, free the data movement, the, the sharing clinical reports uh, uh, data that several people in this room are involved with. Those are ways of routing around the damage. But you know what? We want to design a system that doesn't force us to drive around the bay after the highway has collapsed, right? We want to be building freeways that allow us to get us where we want to go. So, thank you. So thank you very much, Bob and Mary. I think I'm going to tie together um, some of the stuff that we've been talking about here on this panel with regards to intellectual property and some of the stuff that we've been discussing earlier today regarding federal and state regulation of genetic tests as medical devices. Um, one interesting thing to think about is that intellectual property and patents in particular, they serve as another form of a regulatory tool, the same way that FDA approval does. Um, they are government-issued, legally enforceable property rights to exclude others from the marketplace. That is very much a regulatory tool in the same way that FDA approval is. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about how this intersects with the FDA's approval process and how this actually, I think, affects the deployment of genetic testing on the ground to consumers. Um, it, in short, I would say it appears that some of the incentives that come with FDA approval drive the structure of intellectual property surrounding some of the genetic tests that we have. So the goal, therefore, I think, is to sensibly align some of these incentives such that safe and efficacious testing can be profitably deployed in the marketplace, while unsafe or inaccurate diagnostics obviously do not need to be. Um, so first, I think, this, I think this goes without saying at this point, uh, genetic testing, as we've seen, falls under the FDA's purview of medical devices, or at least so it seems. And medical devices, suffice it to say, are frequently patented, and this is especially true of genetic testing schemes. The truth is that there are very few large-scale next-generation sequencing testing platforms that are not protected by patents. So let's take Illumina's MyCTX platform. We heard about that earlier today. It's covered by a number of patents that are owned or directly assigned to Illumina that concerns its proprietary sequencing by synthesis or SBS technology. And just to give you an idea of just how broad some of these are, um, we have one patent, 8399, 188. This is for using particular dyes and terminal stops for sequencing uh, by synthesis. We have patent 8797535. This is a method for using multiple dyes in an optical sequencing system. And then we have patent 8586947. Uh, and this describes MyCTX's uh, flow cell technology. Um, 23andMe, well, their SNP chips are patented, or at least they were at one point. Um, but the company also has a number of famous method patents. Um, one is on an inheritance calculator. Um, you guys may have read about this in the Wall Street Journal, the chances that uh, potential offspring between two parents would possess certain traits. They also have a patent on processing data from genotype chips for finding genetic relatives in a database. I think most interestingly and counterintuitively, a method for anonymizing genetic data. Um, it's not just that these companies own these patents, that these patents are frequently litigated um, and they potentially block market entrance that way. So the current patent dispute between Ariosa and Sequinom I think serves as the prime example here. So Sequinom holds a patent on a commercially successful and as we've learned quite accurate implementation of pre, uh, prenatal genetic diagnostic testing for polyploidy and it has asserted it against uh, several entrants, Ariosa in particular, Veronata as well, a number of other companies. Um, they're the newest round of patent disputes which Bob just mentioned, an appeal of which was heard by the Federal Circuit last week. Um, and so Myriad in an effort I think what could be fairly described as an effort to napalm whatever goodwill it had in the genetics testing community, decided to sue a dozen startups on its patent claims for specifically for cDNA primers and probes, some of which are particularly important to next generation sequencing technology, um, and gene by gene will tell you that, um, but others of which are frankly not that important at all. That doesn't mean that Myriad hasn't been able to stop other market entrants come into the bracket testing market space. And the point here 
is that genetic testing is a patent-rich field even after myriad, that patents are very important to the genetic testing community, and that lawsuits do happen. Um, the interesting point about these two facts is that if you put them together, um, it dictates how companies go about, I think, or would like to go about the FDA approval process if they had their druthers. So let's begin with class one and class two devices. Class one and class two devices could be 510K. And a 510K statement has to contain a statement indicating that the device is similar to and different from other products of a comparable type in commercial distribution. This has potentially serious problems in the patent prosecution context, that is obtaining a patent before the PTO. Um, a patent has to be new, useful, and non-obvious. If you file a statement with a government agency saying your device is substantially similar to other devices in the field, well, you're essentially admitting to the FDA that your device is not new, or at the very least, it is obvious. Um, FDA lawyers seem to be aware of this, and they've been crafting their 510K letters accordingly, but for rapidly innovating companies where advances in the technology are both, I think it's fair to say, marginal and unpredictable, the 510K proves to be what one commentator has called, quote, a trap even for the wary. Um, this perhaps is more of a potential than an actual concern. There's several courts that seem to have rejected the legal argument that the statements in 510K letters could be uh, used to invalidate patents, but those cases, frankly, have been very narrow and on extremely factually specific grounds. It is easy to see how those decisions in the right context could go the other way. And I don't think any company wants to risk its financing based on something like that. It also has potentially serious problems in the patent infringement context, that is when two patent companies sue each other, as I've just been talking about. If you say your device is substantially equivalent to a patent device, um, that seems to me that you've just admitted to infringement. Um, it has long been the case that companies have been so worried about patent infringement that they have not predicated their 510K devices on at least heavily patented products. Um, recently, it seems like the Federal Circuit has clarified this, that simply saying that your device is substantially similar is not necessarily an admission of infringement, but again, I don't think any company wants to risk losing a shirt on, quote, not necessarily. Um, class, three uh, class three devices, however, even though they do cost more, are an entirely different case. There's no substantial equivalent statement that's needed. In fact, there's no statement that's needed at all regarding which intellectual property protects your medical device. Contrast this, by the way, with what goes on in the drug context. So what we see, rather, is post hoc litigation, that is litigation after FDA approval where the damages are huge if you lose. They routinely run into the hundreds of millions of dollars. And I think, I don't know, maybe about once or twice a year, they seem to eclipse a billion. Um, let's take a couple of examples is where I think my concern lies. Um, recently, uh, a company, Exact Sciences, just won class three pre-market approval from the FDA um, for their ColoGuard panel screening test. This uh, won pre-market approval in August. This is a DNA screening panel for a number of genes related to uh, colorectal cancer. It is covered by over 11 patents and something like 150 claims. You'll have to forgive me for not counting each and every claim. Um, it's going to be very, very, very difficult to convince whatever vice president of regulatory affairs you have in your company if you want a 510K Cologuards test. Um, you are going to get sued, and even if uh, half, even if 11, or even if 10 of their 11 patents are not valid, all it takes is one. All it takes is one to uh, block you off the market. Meanwhile, and I think Bob has alluded to this, um, custom devices, mainly in the LDT space, they get to be kept as trade secrets. And this isn't just a matter of, um, of kind of random chance information flow by attempting to corner a market. It is embedded in the statute. 21 USC section 360J, um, you get to keep a custom device and the information that's generated from it as a trade secret. So as long as the FDA approval process is thorny enough that we're essentially encouraging LDTs for the lack of regulation, what we're encouraging is for large-scale LDT providers to keep their know-how as trade secrets. This is the opposite of what we want in the patent context. So let me talk about the upshot of all of this. The upshot of all this, and I think kind of everything that we've been talking about today, is that whichever regulatory scheme that we decide to choose, whether we say everything in genetic testing context should go the class one or class two route because we think our fears about risk are kind of overblown, 
or we don't really know what we're dealing with and everything should be class three or some should be this and some should be that. Whichever regulatory structure we choose, we're encouraging a particular intellectual property structure that matches it and it is those structures by and large that will determine patient affordability and access, hint, cost, right? If we strengthen the regulation of genetic testing towards things that are either class three approval or things that at least cost as much as class three approval, we're encouraging stronger patent protection to enable companies to recoup their costs. This is what we see in the drug context and this is what we see with companies like Illumina today. It's that IP protection that's gonna monopolize access, decrease competition, and keep prices high. If we weaken regulation and we encourage things that are either 510Ks or things that look like 510Ks vis-a-vis -vis class one or class two certifications, the need for intellectual property protection becomes weaker. And also given things like substantial similarity statements, the patents themselves become weaker. Dozens and dozens of companies claiming that their slight iteration of technology is substantially similar to another one makes filing patents in the field particularly difficult. We're encouraging commoditization at that point. And that may be, in fact, what we want to be encouraging, at least with respect to some tests, where both clinical and analytic validity are high. Lastly, and here's where I think things get counterintuitive, although I think, Bob, you've kind of hit on this here, is that if we don't regulate LDTs in one form or another, what we're encouraging is for them to be locked up as trade secrets. Trade secrets do little to advance the field, and they give us no guarantees of either clinical or analytic validity. Depending on the test, what we may want to do is to make 510Ks an easy option to bring these LDTs out from the shadows and into the open without, at the same time, encouraging strong patent protection. Thank you. Having been weakened by the Kathy Hudson precedent, I let the first two speakers flip, but I didn't let Jake move from the last point because having had Jake as a fellow for two years, I knew that in a late afternoon session, it would be like injecting pure caffeine <laughs> into the air. Way too much energy. Whew. Anyway, thank you all. Let's take some questions. Come to the microphone. While that's happening, ah. Interesting to me how much both Bob and Jake talked about information flow, and I think that's something we need to pick up on after the break when we talk about take-home messages. Yes. So uh, genetic testing is. Identify yourself, oh, please. Uh, my name is Lily Kim. I'm an independent consultant, and um, so genetic testing is um, essentially a, a digital information technology. Um, you spoke about IP. Is there anything we can learn from the world of information technology and software and uh, in terms of thinking about the, the IP issues here? Sure. Um, so <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I was really waiting for uh, Bob, but um, I'm, I'm happy to take the first crack at this. So. Um, I think the one thing that we've learned from that space, the one thing that we've learned from the data slash patenting space is, you know, if you want to think of it this way, the law of unintended consequences. The pendulum has swung way, way, way too far in favor of patenting with respect to software. And so what we've seen is a huge pushback from courts and from Congress and from the White House on patents that are related to things like software. And so I think suffice it to say that if we keep seeing such an increase in patent protection with respect to genetic data, we're probably going to see pushback on that front as well. Frankly, I think this is happening right now at the Supreme Court. Bob mentioned two cases. One's called Mayo. The other one is Myriad. Um, both of them have really, I think, stymied a lot of the efforts to patent information generally whether that's a method for diagnostic therapeutics, whether that's genetic information, quote unquote. Um, so that's where I kind of think that we're headed now. Um, I, I, I think again, you know, the, it's, it's this law of unintended consequences that people have been using this tool for a little too broadly. They've been wielding it as a club and now I think um, they're on the receiving end and that's probably what's gonna happen in this space sooner rather than later. 
And I guess I would make two observations about things we, we might learn. One thing I think we can learn from software and computing is that patents are not the only source of incentive for private investment. Because open source made a, it was huge in software. Because for a long time we didn't know that you could have a software patent and the, the rules changed after a while. Um, but, so that's lesson number one is I think there are more paths to innovation than we tend to think of in our simple-minded theories of patent-dependent innovation. Number, number two is, boy, I hope we don't screw it up as badly in biotech as they <laughs> screwed it up in software, because if you need a decoder ra ring for Mayo and Myriad, I don't know who's going to explain to us these two cases, Bilski and Alice, that are even more confused, where the judges, even among themselves, cannot figure out why they agree that they don't like these patents. You Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's right. I think one of the things that I mentioned, just to kind of, you know, I didn't want to give caveats to my own talk, especially when I only had 10 minutes to speak, but I said there's very few large-scale sequencing companies that don't have a lot of patent protection. One notable exception to that is GeneDx, which as a matter of policy has sworn off patent protection going so far as to file an amicus brief in the Myriad case, saying that there shouldn't be patents on any form of gene, cDNA included. Um, we also, uh, Hank, you have, a, I was going to say I have a colleague, but really, do you have a colleague? Uh, we have a wonderful colleague here at Stanford, Lisa Willett, Professor Lisa Willett, who writes substantially about other forms of protection um, besides, uh, you know, patent protection, qua patent protection. There are research and development incentives. There are tax incentives. There are a bunch of ways to harness data to actually get someone to write a check for you rather than necessarily running off to Alexandria, Virginia to file something with the PTO. Next question. Uh, Siddhartha Mitra, I'm a clinical fellow in uh, oncology and genetics here at Stanford. Um, so I'm not a lawyer, but the kind of legal framework that the uh, HIPAA amendment and patient right to their own results seems to be at odds with the intellectual property rights, particularly of proprietary databases. And so can you guys talk about, is there a tension there? And it, how, how are those two things likely to interact going forward? I don't, I don't think I necessarily agree that they are in contradiction. There's definitely a tension between open and closed systems of innovation. For sure there is. Um, but um, I think, I don't think we know exactly what this right to access to data is. I do think that it's actually probably in stronger tension to the debate that's going on in clinical genetics right now of what things you feed back to patients, which is, I think, beginning to converge on you send back only the stuff that you can kind of interpret fairly reliably. And I think here we're talking about a layer of uncertainty where it's very, Mary Claire King gets very upset at me when I use the word variant of unknown significance because she thinks that's a term that Myriad itself invented in order to, to kind <laughs> of frame the debate. Um, but there are going to be a lot of variants of unknown significance, way more than clinically valid findings for the next decade or so until we figure it out. And in that space, I think you're still going to have access to the data, but it doesn't mean there's going to be an interpretive layer there to protect you from misinterpreting it on your own. But I think people are going to figure out how to deal with that. So I, I, I think it's access at different layers that we're talking about here, and I think what we're going to have a right to is only the base layer. There isn't tension, then can that framework be used to compile more comprehensive public databases using the same yeah. data that actually is generated? I think it's going to give us tools for routing around the damage, like I said. And that's what Free the Group, Free the Data is yeah. trying to do. Yeah. 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 I would say, though, I, I hate to disagree with Mary Claire King, but I've always assumed that variants of unknown significance with a ripoff of the Princess Bride's <laughs> rodents of unusual size. <laughs> Uh, I'm Scott McLeod. I'm the founder and president of Startup Online, MIT OpenCourseWare centric world university and school, which is like Wikipedia with MIT OpenCourseWare, planning to be in all languages if we can, but large languages in most countries, um, bachelor, PhD, law, medicine. So I was excited to hear we're Creative Commons licensed, MIT OpenCourseWare is Creative Commons licensed, Wikipedia is Creative Commons licensed. Um, both you, Mary, and Bob, talking about the significance of ownership in data and the sort of demand or interest by uh, public in terms of having access to open data. 
Um, also, Bob, your observation of uh, differential legal systems and uh, the uh, sort of uh, patentability of genetic material. Uh, I'm curious where you see Creative Commons licensing playing out as a, a complement to copyright um, and s sort of parallel forms with databases um, going ahead internationally. Um, and also the significance of um, sort of uh, international law with um, online law schools potentially vis-a-vis uh, -vis the um, company, you know, choosing to patent something in Australia and because it's patentable instead of here. Um. So I think, um, I think one of the most exciting things that's going on in science is people discovering new frameworks for doing open and collaborative research. And Creative Commons is both a cause and a consequence of that very movement, right? And I think that we're finding, I mean, every place I turn, there are people that are trying to do open collaborative science and they're trying to create IP free spaces, but they aren't against patents and IP because we all appreciate the incentive structure for inducing private R&D by creating financial incentives. But people are getting very creative, I think, about trying to find spaces where it makes sense and define the other spaces where it doesn't make sense to have exclusive rights. And I think we're working that out, and I think Creative Commons is part of that, and I think we're gonna have zones of relative IP freedom where we share a lot of data and we share a lot of stuff, and the only thing that we agree is if you created the data, you're the person who deserves tenure. Right? <laughs> this is an academic panel. <laughs> Thank you. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to clarify for Jake that LDTs are regulated. They're regulated under CLIA. What we're arguing against today, at least I am, is dual regulation from both CLIA and FDA. I'm not confident, as one of the speakers from Illumina said, that the world is going to change because I don't see CMS changing. But, you know, stranger things have happened. I guess my question for you is this. Do you see that FDA approval, and I'm going to be specific here, Myriad's approval of a companion diagnostic for PARP inhibitors could be a backdoor way of enforcing their patents. So I think the short, so let me just say something. Yes, I completely understand that LDTs are also r regulated. I, you know, um, having been a patent litigator in a previous life in the pharmaceutical context, think regulation and kind of think only FDA, but I'm obviously aware that CLIA is, plays a very important role here. Um, with that being said, do I think that FDA regulation could play a backdoor into some of the intellectual property problems that we've been seeing? And um, to kind of, again, fall back in my previous life litigating patents, I'll say absolutely. Um, people have used, at least in the pharmaceutical context, FDA approval as a means to gain market exclusivity, especially where FDA approval is tough. Um, we kind of, we're seeing that in the pharmaceutical context a lot today with this kind of sudden, in the past two or three years, rush to get orphan drug approval for a bunch of drugs that very, very, very clearly, uh, whose, primary in, whose primary indication is not its orphan drug use. I certainly see that to be the case here. I can imagine, for example, a company coming out with a revolutionary sequencing platform and saying, you know what we should do? We should get class three approval here, and we should make sure that this thing is wallpapered from every side with patents to make sure nobody could come onto it whatsoever. Um, I, I, I certainly see that as the potential for whether that's going to happen. I mean, I, I certainly see that as potentially happening. Um, but again, I mean, it's gonna be up to the people in this room as to exactly what they want to do with it. I think there's gonna be some panels or some genes that are gonna be sequenced and what we're gonna want because the, you know, both the clinical and analytic validity are so high. We frankly just want commodities sequencing. We wanna be able to send off our sample to something like eBay or Amazon and, you know, we don't really care who services it. We're kind of, comfortable with the fact that someone's going to and we know what the results mean. And the flip side of that is where we have very, we have a lot of difficulty doing some of the sequencing. I think somebody was talking about um, GC rich sequencing and some of the whole exome sequencing problems today. You know, some GC rich regions, you have very, very, very difficult sequencing problems from a whole exome perspective. I, I think we really do have a lot of, um, we do have a lot of accuracy concerns. And I think, you know, that's the, the best case for regulation there, and you know, frankly, if it costs a lot of money to get that right, and if you tell people that you're gonna have some kind of monopoly effect, 
then maybe that's just the price we pay at least for the short term. But I think the short answer, and you know, I don't want to speak for anyone else at this panel, but the short answer is not, and I hope it's not going to be if we spin this out 10 years in the future, patent absolutely everything and prevent anyone else from getting on the market. Yeah, but I, I, th I thank you for bringing that up because I never actually, I'm not in a commercial setting, so I didn't think about you know, going through the FDA for a PMA as a way of enforcing patents or strengthening patents. Yeah. You know, one other interaction that I think may happen, Gail, is one nightmare I have is we're going to see a lot of patents on particular mixes of like 15 gene panels or something like that that then go through a regulatory process, but then you can't, if you add or subtract one gene from your panel, you're going to have to go through the whole regulatory. So there's, there's this locking two two-prong way that blocks entry to the market. And, and we're actually seeing that right now. There's a bunch of companies that have gotten uh, PMA approval in the past year for panel sequencing that have patents on, you know, that specific subset of genes as a method for indicating uh, risk for a particular d disease. Although, would those hold up under uh, Mayo? I think they might. Maybe. <laughs> Any question you ask about either Mayo or Myriad, yeah, and the law, the answer is always maybe, right? <laughs> okay. Hi, Next I'm question. David Hansel um, at Metabiomics, which is actually a microbiome-based diagnostic. And in terms of you get what you ask for, um, you want freedom of uh, your data. So I've had my microbiome done. Let's see, I got 140,000 sequence FASTQ file from American Gut Project. I got a little larger file from Ubiome. Um, yeah, you get all your data. Most people can't do much with it. Um, fortunately, I can. But sort of as you move into patents, nobody's really sure how or what we're going to protect with the microbiome. It's now combinations of um, populations. And as a result, every company but one in working in microbiome is making therapeutics because you can protect that. So the result of that is you're shifting away from diagnostics and you're shifting to therapeutics because there is a way to protect it because if you're going to make a company, if you're going to spend years trying to get this thing to work, you do have some expectation. This is unique in healthcare, not in agriculture and oil and gas, which are two much larger microbiome businesses. <laughs> Very odd. Do you guys have any suggestions on how we can enable microbiome-based diagnostics, or are we just going to stand on the side? Boy, let me think about that, but I don't have anything off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Yeah, we're just 10 years, yeah, we're, we're 10, 15, 20 years behind genomic, but it's going to be a big deal, and the incentives now drive us either to therapeutics only, or it's going to be in oil and gas and agriculture, but not healthcare. Really interesting. I, I think, though, it's not off the top of your head. It's from your gut that you should be answering. That <laughs> <laughs> it's just All right. All right. Well, thank you all. One more round of applause for this panel.